Good morning. Uh, my plan for today is to go through examples where we will be using Ampere's law to calculate magnetic fields for different um, current distributions. Uh, before I start, any questions? Questions? Okay, so let me remind you what uh, Ampere's law says. Uh, if we consider a closed path, C, that encloses a surface S, so that surface S is enclosed by the path, and we define uh, a line integral of the magnetic field intensity around that path, so we have this uh, closed path integral H dot DL, along this closed path C, which means that we are tracing this closed path C with uh, this DL vector, the uh, differential length element, along this closed path. So this is uh, basically the DL, just like the DLs that we saw uh, in uh, the Biot-Savart law. Then you can define a vector DS that is now an area vector, a differential area element, DS, whose direction is defined by this right-hand rule. So if you are tracing the path this way, ds points upwards. If you decide, for whatever reason, to trace the path the other way, then the ds will be pointing downwards. Okay, so these two have to be uh, cons consistently defined. So we have the closed path C, the open surface S, dl, ds, connected through the right-hand rule. <coughs> so the law says that if you take this uh, line integral of the magnetic field around this uh, closed path C, which in electrostatics for the electric field was giving us zero, if you remember, e that the L over a closed path was zero, here, it won't be zero. It will be actually equal to the enclosed current. And that enclosed current can take different forms. And that's what uh, I'm intending to show through the examples today and on uh, Thursday. So this enclosed current can come from uh, wires, plain wires. Uh, we saw this uh, example in the previous lecture. So we have, let's say, this closed path. And there are wires that uh, are coming through. I1, I2, let's say there is a third one that uh, comes downwards. So it can be line currents or wires. In that case, those uh, will be defining the enclosed current. And if the current flows in the direction of ds, so the role of ds here is to define the direction where the flow of the current is considered to be positive. Remember when you do circuits uh, where you have the Kirchhoff current law and some currents when they impinge on the node are positive, when they go out of the node they are negative or vice versa depending on your convention. So likewise, the sign of the current on the right hand side of the Ampere law is actually defined by ds. If the current flows consistently with ds, then it enters the equation as a positive current, if not as a negative current. So here you see that I1, I2 flow consistently with ds, if I uh, define ds like this. Okay. So whereas I3 goes downwards, so it will be included with a minus sign in this case, in the equation. So it, this enclosed current can be wires. That is the uh, most obvious case. It can be also a volume current density
Uh, I remind you this volume current density J in amps per meter squared to find the current. For example, if you have a conductor like this. So now we uh, take into account the volume of the conductor. And I have a current density. J like that and I apply Ampere's law around the wire so I apply Ampere's law around the wire so I take uh, now the uh, solid conductor with some radius so I take this path like this then again I'm enclosing an open surface S that cuts this conductor so in this case the enclosed current will be the flux of the current density through the surface. So remember that this current density in amps per meter squared, that the way we defined it, is the density of the current through the cross section of a conductor where the current is supported. So to find the current, you need to basically take this flux integral through the surface. So in this case, this surface will be the surface uh, where you apply the, uh, the Ampere law because that is the current that you, are, uh, that you are interested in. Note that if the conductor was parallel to the surface, there would be no current enclosed because in that case, the current would flow parallel to the surface and J dot ds in that case would be zero. So in general, you need to have a component of the current that goes through the surface to find something non-zero on the right-hand side. If all the current flows parallel, it's like having a bucket and the water stream passes parallel to the bucket. You don't collect any water. So the enclosed current is really uh, what is uh, referred to on the right-hand side of the Ampere law is how much current do I collect through this cross-section S where I apply uh, the law. And it can be, uh, that is uh, the third uh, case, even a surface current density, just like the surface current density that we saw in the example of the infinite uh, surface supporting a current. Uh, so it can be a surface current density. JS. Let me remind you, this comes about uh, from a um, volume current density. So if you have a conductor like this with a height h and a width w through which you have a volume current flowing. So let's say you have uh, here some uh, volume current density j naught constant. The current you have is J naught times the cross section, H times W. But in uh, cases like, for example, the printed circuit boards, if you, uh, let's say, break your cell phone or your computer and you look at the conductors inside, you will see that they are very, very thin, printed on this uh, green substrate. And therefore, you don't even see that there is a height H. So this is an example where we have a mathematical limit, if you wish, where h goes to zero. A mathematical limit which is very uh, important and very practical. So still the current flows through this conductor. So what happens in this case? If h goes to zero uh, and the current remains finite, the only way that this can happen is if this J0 goes to infinity. Whenever a physical quantity goes to infinity, that means that its physical meaning has been degraded. And uh, here, the loss of the physical meaning is the following, that now my conductor does not look like a volume. It looks like a surface. That's why we are uh, talking about printed circuit boards, printed circuits, right? Everything is printed. On a substrate, there is no volume anymore. That height has actually gone to zero. And that's where now this J0 loses its meaning. And that is the case where we actually take this product, which remains 
finite and we define a surface current density in amps per meter. And now it's amps per meter because you multiply it amps per meter squared times meters and you have now amps per meter. So if I have a surface current density like this, so let's say that we uh, have current that flows only on this surface with some J sub S, I can still apply the, um, the law. Let's say this is now my uh, DL. So I can apply the Ampere law on uh, a circular. It doesn't have to be circular on a closed path C. And in that case, uh, my enclosed current is basically what I enclose here. So Js times this length. Uh, let me call this length uh, uh, delta um, maybe w again. Js times w. So in that case, the closed surface, uh, sorry, the open surface S remains this one. My ds comes out of the board because you see the way that I'm tracing the path, the ds comes out of the board. The current flows consistently with ds, so therefore it is a positive current in Ampere law. And uh, now though it does not flow, the current does not flow throughout the surface, it flows only along this line. So therefore I have to go along this line and find the total current. So this is the summary and now we will see these points in, uh, in examples. Uh, I will start from the second case, the volume current density. So my examples uh, will be on these uh, three cases. So the first example is a cylinder. It's still a wire, but now uh, we, uh, instead of considering the wire as a thin line, we uh, basically take a, we consider a finite radius A. Uh, along the z-axis. And that extends to infinity. So I disregard whatever effects of the edges of the wire. Uh, so I consider this flowing all the way to infinity. And there is a current density, a volume current density J. within the cylinder. And there is no current density outside the cylinder. So the question is, what is the magnetic field everywhere? Okay. So I will use uh, the Ampere law to solve this problem. Uh, in electrostatics, you remember that uh, we talked about Gauss's law, and we said that Gauss's law is universally true no matter what, but it's only useful to calculate electric field when there is some symmetry in the problem that allows us to make an intelligent choice of the surface where we apply the law so that the integral is directly giving me the, the, the electric field. So if you look at uh, the examples we did for Gauss's law, when we never have to do a complex integration. All these formulas, integration formulas that uh, are given to you are mostly for Coulomb's law or in magnetostatics for the Biot-Savart law. 
the, amper, the Gauss's law has to be uh, integrals that are very easy to evaluate and give you electric field times a surface equals to some charge that you can calculate. Same thing applies here. So like Gauss's law in electrostatics, Ampere law is universally true. Is use, but useful for computing magnetic flux density or magnetic field intensity only For cases where there is symmetry in the current distribution that allows us to guess the direction of the magnetic field. So we need to be able to guess the direction of the magnetic field lines. Remember from the first fundamental postulate in magnetostatics, magnetic field lines are always closed. And then once we guess the magnetic field lines, we will go and apply Ampere's law along a magnetic field line. So this closed path C will have to be a magnetic field line. So we have to guess where the magnetic field lines are and then go and choose one of them as the closed path C. Because remember, magnetic field lines are always closed. Cases with symmetry, so that we can guess where the magnetic field lines are These are closed. And then we apply the Ampere law along one of these lines. <clears throat> so here is a, a note for you. You can take for granted that Whenever I have a current distribution whenever I have a current distribution that points in the z direction and depends only on r in cylindrical coordinates such a current distribution is cylindrically symmetric cylindrically symmetric, and you can immediately assume that the magnetic field will be in the phi direction and will only depend on R. And I want to bring your attention to the fact that there is, that the magnetic field, just like the electric field, is a vector. So the direction of that vector and what coordinates it depends upon is a different, these are two different questions. So here what I'm saying is that whenever I'm given a current like that, the magnetic field will be circulating around the current. So the magnetic field lines will be circular. You remember we used the Biot-Savart law to find the magnetic field of a single wire and that was circulating around the wire. So basically what I'm saying here is that if you use wires like this, imagine that you are putting together this distribution by taking wires like this and filling up the cylinder. Then the claim is that the magnetic field will still remain circulating around those wires and it can only depend on the R coordinate. In fact, this is very easy to show because we have here a cylindrically symmetric structure. So if you are an observer and you change your phi coordinate, that is, you are spinning on a circle around the z-axis, you don't see any change in the source. 
No matter where you are, it's like uh, moving around an infinite cylinder. You don't know which angle. From every angle that you look at the cylinder, you see exactly the same thing. So if the sources look the same, the effects of the sources have to look the same as well. That is an intuitive statement. And then, likewise, if you imagine changing your z-coordinate, you don't see any difference in the cylinder because I have assumed that it's an infinite cylinder. And therefore, the magnetic field can only depend on R. We have a very similar situation with those cylindrically symmetric distributions that we encountered in electrostatics. So whenever we have something like this, I know that the magnetic field lines, the magnetic field will be circulating around these z-directed currents. So since I, when I use this statement, then I can apply the Ampere law simply on circles, circles uh, around the z-axis. So that is what I will do. So if we look at this cylinder, let me plot it this way. Let me plot it on the xy plane. So this is uh, now the x-axis, the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis coming out of the board. So we see the current coming out of the board. Take this cylinder and flip it so that the current comes towards you. Then this is, these are the current lines. right here, and the statement I'm making right here is that because this distribution is cylindrically symmetric, the magnetic field will be circulating like this. Okay, so all I need to do now is to find, you see I have expressed the magnetic field with respect to one unknown function of one coordinate. So now I will go and apply Ampere's law. When I do this, just like in Gauss's law, if I manage to express the magnetic field as one unknown function that depends on one coordinate, then I can find that unknown function with Ampere law. I, if I cannot do that, if I cannot get to this stage, um, like I wouldn't be able to get to that stage for the loop uh, that we did, the magnetic dipole that we did on uh, Monday. The, I, I wouldn't be able to uh, put together similar arguments for that. Then I need to go back to the Biot-Savart law to find the magnetic field. But now I can do that. I am in this uh, second set of examples and uh, Therefore, I can apply the Ampere law on circles. And obviously, I have two cases of circles. Circles inside the cylinder and outside the cylinder. Because I will be, if I consider circles inside the cylinder, then I will be capturing part of the current. Whereas any circle that is outside the cylinder captures the entire current in the cylinder. Right? So all these circles, as you see, have the same enclosed current. It's the total current of the cylinder. On the other hand, this circle captures only this part of the current, whereas this circle captures more. So I'm expecting the magnetic field to grow with radius inside the cylinder and then decay away from the cylinder. So let's see uh, what happens. So case one is I'm trying to find the magnetic field inside the cylinder. So this is uh, the cross-section of the cylinder of radius A. Uh, the path, the closed path where I am applying the Ampere law is a circle. 
This is the z-axis, by the way. So that is uh, my circle of radius r. And the ds, as you see, is the area inside the circle. So this is ds. Sorry, um, the, uh, the surface s is that area inside. And ds will have to come out of the board because I'm tracing the, the uh, path like uh, this in the uh, counterclockwise direction. So therefore, my ds points in the uh, direction of the z-axis. So basically here, I have a DL that is equal to phi hat R d phi. I'm going along the magnetic field lines. So since I guessed that my magnetic field will be phi directed, the DL will also be phi directed. So that will be uh, R d phi. So you see I'm tracing the circle DL by DL. So all these DLs are elementary, uh, are elementary lengths, differential length elements. And their length is equal to uh, the differential arc length that you are defining on the circle by changing your angle by, uh, an, a, by a d phi. So it will be R d phi. So if you imagine you change your position from here to here, you are in a circle of radius R. You change your angle by d phi, you're defining an arc length r d phi. And uh, ds will be in the z direction, and that is r d phi dz. Again, um, you can find those elements. Uh, once you know which direction they point, then you can easily find them in uh, your age sheet, books, uh, etc. So now uh, I have uh, the left-hand side of the law. I replace the magnetic field with uh, the expression that I'm assuming. I have dl from here. phi r d phi. And you see that I'm integrating with respect to phi along the entire circle, which means from 0 to 2 pi. Phi dot phi is equal to 1. So here I have an integral which uh, is integral d phi from 0 to 2 pi. That will give me 2 pi. So the left-hand side of the law is 2 pi r h phi of r. Right-hand side now, the enclosed current. So here we have uh, the case uh, I just erased it of a volume current density that goes through uh, this uh, surface. So the volume current density is given to be constant. Uh, it's uh, J naught Z hat. And the area element is uh, R d phi. Uh, sorry, it cannot be dz, it, 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 dr. Sorry for the mistake here. It's obviously dr. R d phi dr. Cannot be dz. So z dot z is equal to 1. This is an area integral. 
you see that we are integrating uh, from phi from 0 to 2 pi. And let me call this r primed because I have reserved already r for this radius here of the circle. So the integration with respect to the uh, radius is from 0 to r. So you see that I'm covering all the current up to this radius r. So this is uh, just uh, plain bookkeeping. It's not about sources versus non-sources that we saw in the bios of our law. I called r the uh, radius of the circle. So now I'm uh, using a different name, r prime. I could have called it tau or uh, rho for the radius uh, from 0 to that r. And uh, z dot z is equal to 1. The constant j naught is out. And then I have 0 to 2 pi d phi, 0 to r, r primed, dr primed. So this is uh, 2 pi. Uh, this integral here is r squared by 2 from 0 to r. Uh, so the 2 and the 2 cancels out, and the result is j naught times pi r squared. I did it step by step because we, we might have had a more complicated case where j could depend on r. But you see that uh, for this particular case, the result is trivial. You could have found it by inspection because you have constant current density j naught. This is the area of the disk p r squared pi r squared, so therefore the total current would be j naught times the area of the disk, pi r squared. So I found it step by step just for tutorial purposes, but you could have found it um, right away by inspection. Any questions up to this point? Yes, please. I don't, I don't need to. Here I put, uh, yeah, no, not because it's a constant, because I don't have any uh, ambiguity. So here I called uh, this radius r. So therefore, I want to make a distinction between the, uh, the b b between the variable that I integrate and the um, bound of the integral, which is r. So that is that is all. Yes, yes. This is not a, this is not really a big uh, deal. Uh, the only problem in the capital R is that we have reserved it for the spherical coordinate system. So then uh, you don't want to mix up the two, right? Uh, if you want, I can do the following. I can call this radius R naught if uh, this is what uh, bothers you, and then take the primes away here. Okay, and then I would find here pi R naught squared. And uh, of course, in that case, I would have R naught here as well. Okay, if that uh, if that uh, uh, bothers you, so it's just a plain bookkeeping. So let's say I apply uh, Ampere law for a radius for on a circle of radius R naught that is less than the radius of the cylinder. Is that? Uh, Uh, sorry, this is not. I've defined the yeah. Okay, so DL still is R not D phi because the DL is on the circle. So it has to have fixed R. All right? So the, the a point is that the line integral happens on the circle, the surface integral on the disk. So on the circle, the radius R is fixed to the radius of the circle. In the disk, it varies from 0 to the radius of the circle. Because you have to include all the, what, what we call enclosed current is the current throughout this area here. So from the center to the end. For 
Right, so I want to emphasize this has nothing to do with Cartesian or non-Cartesian. Here I just had a plain ambiguity between the variables that I took care of. So the distinction between sources or observation points is relevant in the Biot-Savart law, not here. Likewise in electrostatics, primed, non-primed, all this discussion belongs to Coulomb's law, not Gauss's law. Here I had something very, very simple and plain that I call this radius R. So if that bothers you, call this R0. And then uh, we proceed and for R0 less than A, we have this equation. And we have finally H phi to pi R0 equals to J0 pi R0 squared. Uh, you see this uh, cancel out. Pi is cancel out as well, and we find that the magnetic field increases linearly within the circle, within the cylinder. So, or uh, if I now go back to my R, I have a J naught R over 2 for R less than A. So if I am at a coordinate R that is inside the cylinder, I see the magnetic field increasing linearly. And it increases linearly because I'm enclosing more and more and more current. So the magnetic field is being built up inside the cylinder. Now I repeat this exercise outside the cylinder. Uh, so let me just put down case two. I take a radius greater than A. And uh, before I proceed, any other questions on this first case? All right, so the second case, uh, I have again here the cylinder of radius A. My circle now is outside. So no matter how big is this radius R0, it will always enclose the same current because the current now has been exhausted. All of it is inside the cylinder. So the enclosed current is equal to J0 times pi A squared, no matter where you take uh, this radius. On the other hand, the left hand side, has exactly the same form as before. It's uh, 2 pi r naught h phi. So nothing changes in the structure of the integral uh, because that is simply going around the magnetic field lines. So therefore, I get exactly the same result, H phi R naught. So now you see that this is basically the total current of the cylinder. Let me call it I. So this is the total current that is carried by the cylinder. And now you see that Ampere's law says 2 pi R naught H phi is equal to this total current of, of the cylinder, or J naught pi A squared. So you see I'm finding that H phi is J naught pi A squared, the total current of the cylinder, divided by 2 pi R naught. And that means that uh, for a general uh, coordinate R, the magnetic field will be decaying as 1 over the distance from the axis uh, of the cylinder. So finally, H phi of R will be uh, 
uh, J naught R over 2, where R is less than A, and uh, J naught pi A squared divided by 2 pi R, where R is greater than A. So you see this is consistent, the result is consistent with the calculation we did before for the wire. Remember that for a wire I just, uh, of current I, I just wrote the formula before, the magnetic field is I by 2 pi R. As you notice there is a problem in this formula that when R goes to zero the magnetic field goes to infinity. Precisely because this approximation of the line current means that you are observing a wire very far away. Yes? Is, is H a function of R not or R? Well, maybe R not. Yes. So R not is the uh, circle. It's exactly the same question as before. It's the circle where I applied the, uh, I applied the Ampere law. That is a general... Uh, distance R from the cylinder. So it can be any R at the end of the day. So you can call it R, you can call it R0. It is, it is exactly the same thing. What R0 represents here is distance from the z-axis. Exactly, I, I stand by it. Uh, so what, this, what, this, what R0 is, is distance of this point from the cylinder. So this is exactly the same as the cylindrical coordinate, R. So I can replace R not with R. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to um, maybe uh, not create confusion. I'm creating more confusion. But at the end of the day, you apply the Ampere law in a circle. Okay. Previously, I had the whole reason that I introduced R not to answer uh, your classmate's question. Uh, was because I used here R prime and she didn't like it and I think uh, the confusion is that we have used prime coordinates in Coulomb's law and the Biot-Savart law and so on. Uh, so this was not about the prime coordinates or non-prime coordinates because you don't have here sources versus non-sources or observation points in the Ampere law. This is all only in the Biot-Savart law in magnostatics, uh, the Coulomb law in electrostatics. Okay. Uh, so I try to raise this confusion by calling this R and then saying, okay, I apply the circle, I apply uh, the law on a circle of radius R0. But at the end, that R0 is exactly the same as R. Because I'm finding here that if I am at a distance R0 from the cylinder, from the axis, my field will be J0 pi A squared by 2 pi R0. I have made no assumptions on R0. So that R0 is exactly the same coordinate as the R coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system. I have made no restrictions on this R0, right? It represents the cylinder, it represents the distance of my point from the z-axis. So this is exactly what we call R in the cylindrical coordinate system. But it has to be greater than A question. Yes. In this second case, it has to be greater than A. And that is my case too. So I started from there. R0 is a little devil that came to bother me today. So that is what is R0. <laughs> but please answer your question. Uh, ask your question. No, R0, R, I'm assuming R0 is just like the, you know how in box flow we use a radius that keeps on increasing so that we can. Uh, right. So basically, you see, I'm applying here. Let's say that I apply the law at a circle of five meters radius. Okay. And then I'm realizing that no matter which radius I had chosen, if it was 5 meters or 6 meters or 7 meters or 8 meters, I would find that my field is J0 pi A squared by 2 pi, 5 meters, 7 meters, 8 meters, 9 meters. And then I realize that it doesn't matter whether my R0 is 5 meters, 6 meters, 7 meters, 8 meters or 10 meters. Whatever distance I had, that would go here in the denominator. Okay, so that is, that is what I'm trying to say. So all in all, I want to, to uh, say one more thing about this example, that 
In the original calculation, this one, h phi i by 2 pi r, we had a problem, which actually was a bigger problem than whether r is r naught or vice versa. It was that when r goes to 0, the magnetic field here goes to infinity. And that is a side effect of the fact that we have assumed that this current flows in an infinitely thin wire. Okay. And there is nothing infinitely thin or infinitely large in nature. Everything has you know, a certain uh, set of dimensions. And in fact, this is the right way to, appro to approach this problem. So if I consider a finite radius of this wire, you see that I realize that nothing is infinite. The current builds. And inside the cylinder, so now I'm looking inside this wire, it increases linearly. And then it starts decreasing uh, as 1 over r. So now no infinity, no divergence of the magnetic field. I have this uh, nice evolution of the magnetic field inside and outside the cylinder. And at the end of the day, this formula is consistent with this one. Because you see, this one tells us that if I am uh, outside the wire, I see the magnetic field decaying as one over distance. And that's exactly what we found here. Because those two problems, the one we solved today and this one, have to be consistent. The reason being that you know this from power cables. If you look at them from very far away, they seem infinitely thin. Or phone cables. If you look at them from far away, they seem infinitely thin. If you go close to them, you see that actually they're not infinitely thin. They have some finiteness. So this, is, this uh, problem is the long distance view of this problem. And therefore, I should have consistency between this formula and this formula. And I do have that uh, right here. OK, so this was my uh, first example. Any uh, other questions? Any? Yes. Uh, say that again, I have them. Yeah, I kept it there. Uh, so I guess uh, you are asking about this pi and this pi. Yeah. yeah, I kept it there to show the consistency between this case and this case. Oh, okay. uh, because it gives me the total current that is carried by the cylinder. Yeah. But of course, you can uh, uh, so cancel them out. In that case, this is the magnetic field intensity for infinite, uh, infinite line, right? Uh, so basically, that is pretty similar to what we what you have proved here, right? Right. Yeah. So today I solved this problem. So you have the wire of finite radius that supports the current. Uh, previously, with the uh, Biot-Savart law, we solved this problem. There can be multiple uh, multiple line of current in that uh, cylinder, or just one line of current. Uh, sorry, uh, there is a question. Uh, can you ask it again? Will there be a multiple line of current? There? Because this, uh, this law says that whatever encloses that surface, right? Whatever current. So here, so the question is if there are multiple currents or one current inside the cylinder. So here you have a volume charge density. The whole cylinder is supporting a current, right? So with a uh, constant uh, density. Okay, any other questions? So I have just uh, uh, two minutes. Uh, they are not enough for any example. I'll continue tomorrow. But the point to be made here is that the, for the Ampere law, you really need to know the magnetic field distribution and uh, so that you can pick the path along the magnetic field lines. Second, in this case, we. Uh, knew that the magnetic field would have this particular form. The magnetic field lines will be circular. However, any cylindrical current distribution that you see in homework problems or elsewhere will have exactly the same magnetic field distribution. So I just wanted, I don't have time to solve. I will uh, solve more examples tomorrow. But I just wanted to mention that current distributions like this
So let's say you have a current that flows on a cylindrical shell. That is cylindrically symmetric. So still the magnetic field would be circulating. Uh, if, if I had uh, the cylinder like this, the same cylinder, but now my current was of this form. That's still a cylindrically symmetric current distribution because uh, you can make the assumption that H is H phi over of R for any current distribution that is Z directed and depends on R only. So this is Z directed depends on R. So it doesn't have to be constant. It can depend on the radial coordinate. If that's the only coordinate it depends, then you can always apply the Ampere law on a circle. So please keep that in mind. Uh, you may see relevant examples here and there in the homework problems. And uh, with that, thank you for your attention. And uh, we'll continue tomorrow with more examples.